be quantitative and it needs to be qualitative. Um, there's no, there's a cost involved. I mean, it's just the way it is. You have to make an effort, and even if you do like one child over the other, or even if you do prefer spending time with someone else over your spouse in certain situations, your love for one another and your investment in the relationship should cause you to say, sometimes I need to do what she wants to do, even though I don't like what she wants to do, because I like her, amen, and so forth in the relationship. So let's talk about some interventions and preventions. Uh, interventions, in other words, what can we do to get back where we were? By the time most couples realize this, they've been drifting apart in their relationship and they're already in the crisis mode. In fact, an actual crisis may have taken place and maybe that's why they're before you for getting counseling right now. Maybe it's too late, but I hope not. This is usually when couples realize that the loving and intimate foundation that normally would be uh, stable and would offer steady support is now in trouble in their lives. There's no present approach to correcting the drift. You have to think broadly as a counselor. Once the marriage is in crisis mode, all the dimensions of intimacy must be focused upon and uh, the course must be set to bring the intimate marriage relationship back to a state of peace, harmony, and love. Oftentimes, this is where a counselor or a pastor is brought into the picture to help navigate the process. Unfortunately, too many couples come too late to get help. You, you, we have a lot of people that even show up when one of them has already decided they're, going, they're, they're not, they're not going to work this out, but they'll come to try to appear to be agreeable when in reality all they're really seeking is either you to affirm this marriage is over with as a counselor or they want to be able to say to outsiders, well, I went to counseling. We did what we could, but it just wasn't repairable. And, you know, that's usually... Uh, not the case at all. It's just that when someone's mind has been predetermined, it's very difficult to help them. In the book of Revelation in 2.4, uh, the Lord was speaking to the church of Ephesus and he was warning them that they had left their first love. He immediately gives them instruction to the way back to their first love. And he tells them this. He says, repent and do the first works. And you know, really, this is the case in most marriages. Most marriages need those times of refreshing. They need those moments where they come together and they say, you know what, I've neglected you. I've neglected our relationship. Forgive me. I repent. And then it says in the book of Acts, with repentance comes the times of refreshing. And it's a healing process that begins the repairing and the restoration. But we have to, excuse me, we have to follow through with it. We have to follow through with it by doing the first works. What got you into this marriage in the first place? Go back to those kind words. Go back to the place of passion. And that's what he was speaking to here in Revelation chapter 2, was that they were to return and go through the motions again as they express their passion and their love for him. Um, and this is a caution to each of us that we want to be uh, attentive to this area and always be reflective of where our marriage is and what we need to do to make it better and to make it right. Uh, some preventions, what can we do to keep from drifting apart? For those who are uh, in a pre-crisis situation, you need to be proactive and you need to be preventive. You, you need to be aware of the danger of drifting and you need to act before it occurs. Here's a few things that you can do. Number one, you want to go back to making God the center of your marriage relationship. Uh, you need to get back in church. You need to get involved with couples that are Christian couples. People who are going where you want to go in your marriage. Amen. If you spend time down at the bar, if you spend time with, with girlfriends or boyfriends uh, or, I mean, uh, buddies that are, are out carousing and running around, this is not going to be a healthy influence on your marriage. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The idea there is, is that get God back in the center of the relationship. Let God come back into your marriage and begin to build this back with you. Uh, he is the third cord that will bond you and unite you together. Make it a point to attend a marriage-friendly church. Find somewhere that you can go that's going to strengthen your marriage. Amen. Seek out environments offering couples the opportunity to grow. Attend marriage conferences. Read books on marriage. It's amazing how many people will say when there's a marriage conference offered by the church or some ministry uh, and it's presented to them, they'll say, well, we don't have any problems in our marriage. We don't need to go to do that. The but the sad thing is, is that the people who go to marriage conferences, the people who attend marriage teaching or, or, or 
or connect with a marriage couple's Bible study are not people who are having crisis in their marriage. They're people who attend it to prevent crisis in their marriage. Nobody sets out. Nobody has a goal to have a marriage that's going to fall apart. And, and nobody in their right mind um, would would uh, just uh, seek out and, uh, and, and destroy their marriage. No, it comes up through subtle drifting and separating of one another. So we need to do the things that we're going to save our marriage and help our marriage stay together for the long haul. Amen. So um, make a dual commitment to both marriage as an institution and a relationship. Acknowledge that God's idea is where marriage comes from. And in order to, to honor God, I must honor the marriage covenant. Amen. And then make a commitment to the relationship, which means I'm going to invest in it. I'm going to do the things necessary to make it work. Amen. Uh, make couple friends. Make make friends with couples who have the same goal of having strong marriages as you do. Then evaluate your marriage by the six dimensions of intimacy. Uh, are we making an effort to succeed in each one of those? And then regularly self-assess by asking some of the basic questions. And you can answer some questions like these questions right here in this little self-assessment of your marriage. Answer this question. How close do you feel to your spouse? How much time do you spend together on your marriage development? Do you have an intimate connection? What is the quality level of the time that you spend together? Just answering those four questions will pretty well pinpoint you where you're at in the progress of your marriage relationship. You might say, well, I couldn't affirm, t affirm all of those, but I feel like we're doing okay. Uh, but where are you headed? And are you drifting? That's the thing we have to look at and be careful of. There's some goals of the, prevent, of, uh, the preventative interventions. Excuse me. Um, and uh, most of all, though, I would just say that uh, we have to be committed to our marriage. Amen. And committed to God to make it work. Amen. Second uh, Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Everything you need is in the Lord. And everything that you need is in the Word of God to help build a strong marriage. Amen. And so I would just encourage you, and of course this is a counseling course, so if you use these elements, there's enough material in what we're presenting to you this in this particular course to help a lot of couples. Uh, because the basis of what most marriages uh, are dealing with, uh, we're going to cover it somewhere in this before this session is over. God bless you. And this concludes this session. We'll be back for the next one shortly. This is Pastor Lane. We're back. This is uh, the teaching on I. Uh, we're calling it I Still Do. This will be our uh, fifth session, and we're talking about the power of past hurts and marital satisfaction. These last two are a little bit shorter, uh, I believe, as far as uh, in you know in length, but they're powerful in the sense that where so many marriages that are failing are stuck at this point. Uh, and it is the point of being able to turn loose of the past. Turn loose and move forward and go forward in their relationships in life. Psychologists agree, uh, it's, no, it's no secret, we've all known it, that uh, a lot of the emotional disorders that are present in the lives of many adults, and I'm talking about many married adults, have a history uh, of uh, originating through trauma and unresolved wounds of the past. It can go as far back as um, you know, uh, childhood, or it could be a previous marriage, or it could actually just be previous events in your present marriage. But many times these things will become such profound um, wounds and sc leave scars that they will um, come back to haunt us years later 
and actually block the love that we have for our spouses. But God offers us help and He offers us healing in this. Uh, I, the truth of the matter is, is that, and, and psychologists know this, that many of the people, even people in mental hospitals, uh, a lot of their problems and issues originated from wounds and um, uh, trauma and uh, you know abuse and things that were inflicted upon them that later in life became more than the mental faculties could handle and they just we say they lost their mind but in fact they developed mental disorders that caused them to not be able to function in society like a normal person and God has healing for that and even for those people so many of them if they can get to the point to where they can truly receive the healing power of God the spiritual birth the new creation and for give the past and let God go in and restore and heal, they can come out of a mental hospital. They can come out of a state um, of just totally wrecked life and begin to live a normal, healthy life. I've known people that have done this, and it is possible. That's why the gospel is called the good news. Amen. Uh, previous hurts are divided into basically three categories. There are those that are of the sexual or the physical nature and those that are of the emotional, emotional nature. So basically we're saying sexual, uh, abuse, neglect, and then, of course, um, emotional. Sexual hurts currently in the United States estimate 20 to 40 percent of females and one in six males are sexually abused before the age of 17. Just some statistics here to help you get on board. Not all abuse has long-term trauma traumatizing effects. The difference greatly depends on the factors involved. It greatly depends on intervention of the Holy Spirit. It, it depends on getting people uh, to know Christ and getting them discipled and taught the things of God. The earlier the better, especially the sooner the better after the event that's taken place. Some of the factors that determine the sev severity of the trauma, um, how close was the relationship? Uh, the greater the age distance between the victim and the perpetrator. Um, how long did this thing go on? How often was it? Uh, was it overt versus covert? In other words, uh, was there penetration or was there not? If it was a, you know, in a sexual sense. Uh, the responsiveness of the parents to, dis to disclosure. Uh, did they deny it? Would they refuse to believe it? Uh, were they blaming the child? Was there punishment involved? All of these kind of things it will intensify or minimize the impact emotionally and mentally uh, upon the victim. Also, if their body responded sexually, this confuses and increases the trauma of the child. Sexual abuse can also include adult rape. Uh, the focus here is on childhood abuse because the effects used there are more severe because children have less developed reasoning ability to accurately interpret the abuse and fewer coping skills. But it can also be a result of something that happened later in life. Abusers are what we call trust bandits. And this is where the deepest scars are left. Most of the time abusers are, or can be adults in the child's life, close relatives, siblings, things of that nature, and these are people that they trust and they depend upon. The sexual effects of abuse can affect marital satisfaction in, in a number of different ways. Uh, it may cause an avoidance of sexual intercourse. Sexual intercourse is what we call a trigger event that can elicit flashbacks of the original sexual abuse. In other words, uh, the couple gets married and they're, you know, they're on their honeymoon, or it could happen sporadically, not all the time, but the victim's uh, partner in the marriage relationship suddenly has a flashback of that event that causes them to want to shut down in the, in the uh, sexual relationship. The generalized trust problems, and even with those that they love, because they were uh, that a trust was broken and, and it was taken advantage in their life as a young person, now they have trouble trusting people throughout life, especially those that are close to them. They may have what we call a damaged goods syndrome. In their mind, they see themselves as spoiled, having been ruined. It's a sense of utter personal brokenness. False guilt about the cause of abuse, especially children, since somehow they may have caused this to happen and therefore they're a bad person. Children sometimes go all their lives with this, and they need to be set free and helped. Amen. It can cause dead emotions. It can cause a fear of strong emotions. Uh, the person becomes quite withdrawn and not expressive. Uh, they don't know how to show love for fear of provoking something that in them they perceive to be dirty or evil. 
life-dominating problems can arise out of these things. Things like addictions, such as substances of alcohol, food, work, internet, soap operas, children, pornography, helping others. Uh, in other words, they want to totally put themselves into some other distraction in order to keep their mind off of the pain that's hurting inside of them. And this is oftentimes what is happening. Uh, that's all that addictions are. Addictions are nothing more than self-medication. They're trying to deal with the pain or with the need, with the hunger that's inside of them. And so they're just distractions. And this is how these things happen. There's some strategies that can increase marital satisfaction in these areas. Uh, first of all, you need to educate both partners as a counselor uh, in the relationship about the effects of sexual abuse. Help each spouse understand what is taking place, what's transpiring, and the fact that it's not a rejection, it's not a fact that you're not loved, it's an emotional response or a mental response that's taking place. Uh, and the reason is you can't manage what you don't understand. But by increasing knowledge, we decrease the associated confusion and the fear. You begin to alleviate those things and you begin to open up the pathway to restore the right um, types of uh, response in the marriage relationship and it helps the other partner deal with their feelings the fear of rejection uh, things of that nature um, we want to encourage couples to make changes in their sexual relationship to create an atmosphere of safety for the abuse in other words how can we make this more safe for you remember significance and security okay how can you feel secure in this relationship um, sometimes just altering the position of intercourse. Sometimes women feel overwhelmed in the normal position because they feel overpowered by the weight and the size of the male. The husband can demonstrate his willingness to stop uh, and uh, and to 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 comfort or to to reassure her at any point in the relationship when flashbacks occur or fear uh, comes to the forefront. And this increases satisfaction as they work together to hasten their the healing process. Uh, you want to suggest the couple find a Christ Center support group. Um, and there are places like this. I, I always encourage churches, if you have very many people, there's a need for this. I assure you, if you've got 100 people, you've got enough people in your church that need this kind of ministry and help uh, because of the statistics and the number that have had to deal with this. Then refer the couple to seek out individual counseling if one of them seems to be stuck. In other words, it doesn't always have to be the couple uh, in session. Sometimes we need to just focus on her or we need to just focus on him. Perhaps both of them at individual times. And then emphasize the fact that both spouses must focus on the quality of their relationship to God. Uh, nothing is going to help more like a deeper understanding of God's love, God's healing power and His strength, allowing the Holy Spirit to come and empower and comfort and to just speed the process of healing and restoration. Amen. So many people need uh, healing from torment just about the unanswered questions that they have in their hearts. And some of those questions sound like this. Uh, why didn't God help me at the time? And some will say, why has he helped others and he didn't help me? These are legitimate questions that people will be asking. And the answer to these questions is that everyone has a choice. And those who choose to be a part of God's influence who choose to not be a part of God's influence do bad things. So why do bad people do bad things? Because they chose not to obey the Lord. And unfortunately, you got caught up in it. And it wasn't the Lord. God didn't bring this upon you, but God was present with you. And He was there to comfort you. And if you can see yourself in that moment and know that God was there and that God loves you and that God holds nothing against you release the person who violated you forgive them let it just fade away into the past it will always be a memory but it doesn't have to be a memory filled with pain or that can hinder your progress in relationships going forth uh, physical abuse here's the next one physical abuse the effects of physical abuse can uh, affect marital satisfaction in a lot of ways too some research suggests that while girls are more often the victims of sexual abuse boys often experience physical abuse and this may switch in adolescence, but either way, there will be scars whether we see them or not. Uh, some of these look like this. Emotional numbness. Um, a survivor technique that uh, is later carried into marriage and into life in general. Okay? Uh, the second one might be avoidance of trigger events. 
In other words, they try to do everything they can to stay away from conflict. They try to avoid getting anybody mad at them. They like to stay away from loud voices. And it's because these things trigger those memories of what happened to them in the past. Uh, there may be a use of physical violence when they lack good verbal and other coping skills themselves. How many of you know that the sin of our forefathers is passed down for four generations? And even though that sin was perpetrated against us and our heart is broken because of it, and we say that I'll never be an alcoholic like my father. I'll never abuse my children like I was abused. Oftentimes, the very children who say that and who experience that trauma and that pain end up doing the same thing to their children because those generational spirits need to be broken. Uh, a demonic spirit is one who comes and who drives us and pushes us to do things that we normally wouldn't want to do. That's how you know it's demonic. And you can take authority over that in the name of Jesus. You can cast that out. Amen. But these times, then this doesn't happen to everybody, but it can happen to some people. And they'll do the very thing that they don't want to do. And five minutes later, they're apologizing for it and promising never to do it again, but they will repeat it unless that is broken in their life. Amen. There are some strategies you can use to increase marital satisfaction. We can educate everyone about the issues of physical abuse in marriage. Okay, educate the couple about the trauma associated with physical abuse. And we can refer the couple or individuals for counseling if they seem to be stuck. And then we can address the importance of physical safety or communication and sexual counseling uh, will be useless. If we don't deal with this, then the counseling won't help. Uh, and this is oftentimes the root of unproductive counseling. I can work with her all day long, but if he doesn't understand that he's got to provide a safe environment for her, she's got to know that he is protective of her and he is sensitive to her feelings and her pains and her emotions, then she can't begin to act out and put into practice the things she's learning and the things that she's overcoming in the relationship. So it's a two-way street working together to bring about this healing. Uh, it's amazing uh, when you've counseled for years uh, of the stories and the things that you encounter. I mean, I have counseled couples where we lived in a small um, East Oklahoma community and we've had situations where the man uh, for years would discipline his wife by hanging her by her feet in the barn. Uh, you know, and beating her. And she tolerated this for years. Sometimes people's ignorance is not only just anger and violence and stupidity, but they, some of this stuff is even learned and practiced uh, in our society today where we think that nobody would do such a thing. And sometimes people need to literally be uh, uh, taught how civilization acts and lives. People will tolerate things. Sometimes because of codependency uh, and because of uh, fear, sometimes people, especially women, will tolerate abuse and uh, 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 violence that they should have gotten out of long ago without this other person or something. And so we really need to uh, help the people and be ready to encourage the people. Amen? Amen. Um, so I want to talk here a little bit now about the third point. This is uh, emotional abuse. The effects of emotional abuse may affect marital satisfaction in several ways also. All the victims of sexual and physical abuse will experience some level of emotional abuse. I mean, obviously. Uh, but the emotional abuse can come in many forms. It can come as neglect, verbal abuse, terrorizing, isolating, corrupting, rejection, exploitation, and even ignoring a person can become abuse over time. Uh, specifically, there are two main categories of emotional past hurts and abuse, and they are, unre they are unrealistic expectations and forms of emotional abandonment. So you've got two categories there, unrealistic expectations and emotional abandonment. Unrealistic expectations, this consists uh, of unrelenting, repeated expectations on a child. A six-year-old can never act like a 12-year-old, and a five-year-old is going to wiggle in church no matter what you do because their developmental stages haven't progressed to the place to where they can act beyond where they are, where they rationalize, where they think. And so if we put expectations on them that are unreasonable, we're going to harm them emotionally. And no matter how unrealistic parental expectations may be, children nearly always assume that they reflect the truth. 
They often cope by striving for the superhuman perfection reflected in their parents' unrealistic expectations. And as adults, they find their security and identity in performing and pleasing as perfectly as possible, even to the point that they may deny their normal human limitations and struggles. Children think mom and dad are right all the time, even when they're wrong, and they will try to live up to the wrong expectations of their parents thinking that they are right expectations and it is to the detriment of the development of the child. These children feel ashamed and unfulfilled as a person because they can't measure up. They can't be successful. Sometimes this happens even between couples uh, in their relationships. Some of these effects of the unrealistic expectations that impact marital satisfaction. In other words, what are you saying? These things carry over into the marriage and they come in these types of forms. All or nothing thinking. They believe there's no in-between. They are either perfect or trash, a winner or a loser. And that, in second, that second place is no place at all. And so they begin to have these mindsets and it begins to destroy and erode the marriage uh, relationship. The second one is perfectionism. Uh, and perfectionism is a should-be way of life. Uh, these are the ones who take great pains in life and give them to others. <laughs> Perfectionism produces great dissatisfaction in the perfectionist and great discouragement in the one they put their standards upon. Uh, if you are a perfectionist, you need to get in, with the Lord and get in the Word of God and balance your perfectionist. It's great to be a person of excellence, but excellence is something you strive for in the Lord. Perfectionism is an act of the flesh. It's works. And perfectionism says that I must become. And excellence says that through Christ I will be. Amen. Perfectionism will cause you to do, make your life miserable and make the lives of those that you have around you miserable. There's some strategies that will increase merit satisfaction in these areas. Uh, they must not underestimate the power of perfection. Learn to acknowledge human flaws without indulging them. They need to explore their beliefs about being human. They need to encourage both partners to develop a biblical anthropology. Uh, there is none perfect, no, not one. That needs to be driven into the mind of the perfectionist and the one who's been under the influence of the perfectionist. They need freedom to honestly face and get help for personal problems. And there must be room for grace in the relationship. And then we want to emphasize the need for both of them to reevaluate their concepts of God and the basis of their relationship. Most people's perfectionist attitude comes from a misunderstanding that God is a perfectionist. And God is not a perfectionist. God is perfect, but He is not a perfectionist. God is not driving or forcing others to be perfect. God gave us perfection in the form of His Son on the cross. Amen. We are made perfect through Christ. Amen. And as we walk in covenant with Him, God looks upon us and He sees the blood of Christ and He sees a perfect being who is worthy of acceptance and He loves you just like you are. Not that you and I should have lived and strive to be like Christ, but that we find our help in Christ. Amen. And not in our own self-expectations. Perfectionists have a tendency to worry a lot about how you as a spouse make them look or how the children make them look and God wants us to focus on the fact that Jesus makes us all look good amen uh, emotional abandonment is the next one emotional abandonment can come from many places uh, it, it, just to overview some of the origins uh, concerning it it could come out of uh, the death of a parent a child can lose a parent at an early age and they have this sense of abandonment in them that impacts their development and how they relate and socialize uh, divorce and fatherlessness also parental alcoholism the fact is is that a parent who's an alcohol uh, alcoholic most of the time is an absent parent they may be present in body but they're absent in far as emotionalism uh, and as far as relationship goes and so these things can give the child a sense of abandonment and can create some real problems in life later on as far as that goes. Uh, and then there's effects of emotional abandonment that impact marital satisfaction. So it carries over. Uh, if you are dealing with abandonment issues, you're going to have trust issues. You may have an expectation of being abandoned again. And it's hard to enter wholly into the relationship. It's hard to completely trust your spouse. It's hard to completely let go of the past and embrace the future. 
So there, there might be some extreme clinging uh, or distancing in relationships. It can go either way depending on the makeup and the personality of the child or the now adult. Uh, adolescent children of alcoholics may be especially likely to deny the personal and marital problems because they were taught to focus on how things look and manage those things rather than to solve problems. That's one of the scenarios of a home that's, uh, that is built around an alcoholic. The alcoholic situation dictates the environment and the activity of the home. Uh, we're covering up this. We're trying to hide that. We're trying to keep them out of this trouble. We're trying to pretend like everything's okay and give this appearance to the community that we're the wholesome family. When in fact, we're broken and we're hurting. Amen. Um, we need to be more emotionally invested in drinking. A drink. They may become more in. They may become more emotionally invested in the drinking parent than they are in their spouse. In other words, they're still going back to try to pick up behind their father, who's an alcoholic, or to bail him out, or to try to rescue him and help him. And uh, they need to make that transition over to their spouse and begin to build that marriage relationship. Some strategies that we can use to increase marital satisfaction would be, again, to learn the truth about emotional abandonment, to resolve this magical thinking of self-blame, emphasize hope for change, and then concentrate on three things, forgiveness, grief, and God. As helpers, we need to be well-versed in the doctrine of forgiveness and able to articulate it for the client. Uh, remember that forgiveness is a process as much as it is an event. Forgiveness begins in faith. I forgive in the name of Jesus. Doesn't mean you feel like it. Forgiveness is a fact. It's a reality. It's an act and a deed. Once it's done, it's done. Amen. But feelings may come with time. But feelings do not determine whether we've forgiven or not. Forgiveness is an act, a choice, a decision to release someone. All past hurts include the element of loss. So we need to be able to help people grieve. Grieve the death of a dream. There's no perfect marriage. Some couples need to just let go of all the fantasy and all the dream of the white knight in shining armor and the beautiful princes and we're going to run off into the sunset together and just grieve over it. Realize we messed up. we got some problems here. That's okay. We can have a wonderful marriage with time and counseling and ministry. The Holy Spirit will work in our lives and we'll have a great marriage. But right now we got to let go of all of our false expectations and dreams. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, we're back for our final session. And this session deals with forgiveness and reconciliation in marriage. Uh, we want to deal with the fact that uh, God has all the power and all the ability to make our marriage new. It may not ever be the same again, or like it was in the past, but it can be new. It can be fresh, and it can be a wonderful, fulfilling, and satisfying marriage if we're willing to go in this realm of forgiveness. Amen. Uh, and forgiveness, by the way, has to be ongoing. It has to be based on willingness to make adjustments and determine to be reconciled. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're facing. It doesn't matter what has happened or transpired. When we say... I still do. We're making a commitment. And we're saying that in order to make that happen, I'm willing to forgive. That I'm willing to try once more. It doesn't make any difference whether it's your marriage or any area of your life. People are going to fail you. And they're going to hurt you. But if you close yourself off from all people because of fear of failure or being hurt, then you'll find yourself a social outcast. You'll find yourself a miserable, lonely person. God calls on us, the church, the bride, to be willing to believe once again and to hope once again that God can give us relationships that are going to be satisfying and fulfilling. And He wants to show it first in your marriage and make it happen. So how do we process this type of forgiveness? Well, just to give you some advice as, as, as counsel, uh, you instruct the couple to approach it this way. Approach it with patience. Each partner must experiment with different strategies. Forgiveness is not something you can go to the grocery store, store and buy a can of and open it up and in there you have it. No, you have to be open and receptive to forgiveness to begin with. 
You make a conscious decision to forgive your spouse. When images of the betrayal hurt or flash in one's mind, we have to think of the cross and Christ and act in a forgiving way. Amen? Just like Jesus did. We have to reject those painful thoughts that you have already forgiven. Forgive those that you haven't. I found out in counseling because I've had this happen. I've had people come to me and say, my wife cheated on me. My husband cheated on me and I don't know what to do. I'm devastated. And one of the first things they'll say is, uh, I, uh, you know, as they told me the story, all I see is these mental pictures and I can't get it out of my mind. And this is one of the first things that you're going to have to deal with is... First of all, you don't need to know all the details. But for some reason, the human mind says, when I have been so uh, wrongly treated, I want to know exactly what happened. And they'll try to get that spouse to explain all the details of the affair. You don't know, need to know the details. The more information you have about the sin and how it took place, the more the devil will use that to torment you. What you need is you need to set your heart and your mind to... Align your thoughts with the healing power of Christ and then to begin to get in the Word. The Word is God's thoughts. Get God's thoughts on the issue. You know, God's wife betrayed Him. God eventually had to get a divorce. He divorced Israel. But God never once sinned in that situation. He never once gave up hoping and dreaming and wishing and waiting to restore Israel. Israel forced the relationship to a point that it ended. And God wants to restore your relationship. Nobody has been mistreated and has been wrongly treated more than God has by us. Yet He forgave us and He loves us. Amen. So that's why you have to reject the painful thoughts that you have and then and you have to forgive and you have to continue to work on forgiving. Never throw an error or a mistake back in your spouse's face at a later date. And don't use it as ammunition in a new argument later on. Don't seek retribution. Trying to get even only extends your pain and it won't make you feel better in the end. You won't accept that you may never know the reason for the transgression or the behavior or the mistake. Sometimes people don't know why they do the things they do. They just have a period, a moment of stupidity and they do the wrong thing and it's horrible. They can't explain it to you. And sometimes people can. And sometimes the more you know, the more it hurts. I don't mean that we as counselors don't try to work through the details and say, where did this drifting begin? What led to this event actually happening? Yes, anytime there's a breakup in a marriage, we, we both have some things to learn and some things to uh, perhaps ask forgiveness for and to we work out in our relationship. But ultimately what's important is not going back and wallowing in the heart ache and the pain. It's going forward forward where the healing is and where the health is. Amen. Remember that forgiveness does not mean that you have condoned that hurtful behavior. Just because you've forgiven them doesn't mean you agree with what they did or you're overlooking it. No, not at all. Be patient with yourself and allow yourself time to heal. If you're still unable to forgive or find yourself dwelling on the betrayal of the hurt, you, need, you might need to seek a professional Christian counselor. They may need some specific one-on-one uh, -on -one time and help with this. Uh, to work through these issues. Uh, the one who caused the hurt can ask forgiveness to help rebuild trust in the marriage. This is when you want to show true contrition and remorse for the pain that you caused. Don't try to excuse it away. Don't say it wouldn't happen but or if. Just own up to it and repent. Be willing to make a commitment to not hurt your partner again by repeating the hurtful behavior. Accept the consequences of the action that created the hurts. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how many people, and particularly Christian leaders, that I have had that have come to me in the years, especially in previous years when I did a lot of counseling, would come to me from another church or our leaders in my church and say, you know, I had this failure, I sinned, this is causing our marriage to have problems. And I say, okay, you know, particularly if it's a person in leadership and it's, they're, they're about to get on the verge of divorce or there was an infidelity that took place, I say, you need, you need to take some time out of leadership, step down, we need to focus on your marriage relationship. How many times they, they came in with the whole, uh, I, I, I assume, genuine in, intent of restoring their marriage and healing it, but when I ask them to submit to some type of restoration process, immediately they start backing up. 
It makes you wonder how sincere they are. If you want to restore your marriage, it needs to become first, priority in everything. You don't need other responsibilities. You don't need to... Uh, uh, you know, be bogged down with all kinds of other things pulling at you when you're trying to save your marriage. Though not to mention the fact that your your position puts you in a place of example that makes it questionable whether you should continue in your role. Uh, humble yourself and give yourself wholly to the restoration process, whatever that may be. Amen. Be open to making amends and don't dismiss your spouse's feelings. And then make a heartfelt apology. And this includes a plan of action to make things right. Listen, if you don't have a plan of action to make things right, you're not going anywhere. All you're going to do is say, I'm sorry, and they're going to say, okay, I forgive you, and the two of you are going to go back in your relationship, and in your own power and strength, you're going to find yourself trying to make the marriage work. But if you will submit to restoration under the guidance of a counselor or even better yet, a Christian coach, coaches deal with the present and the future, counselors deal with the healing the hurts of the past, the, the violated one, the victim may need some counseling, but the two of you basically need some coaching to help take you through steps toward the goal of being restored to a better marriage and a better relationship. Amen. So, and it begins with words. It begins with apologizing. It begins with acknowledging and asking forgiveness before your spouse and the Lord. But it doesn't stop there. That's not enough. So you commit the whole issue in prayer. And you seek out godly counsel or coaching or both to help bring accountability for the fresh start. And then I would encourage you to have them read uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 13. And because Jesus teaches there the process of how to approach the, an offended, how an offended brother is to approach, um, you know, the one who offended them. And, and how to deal with forgiveness and everything in that nature. And then it's time to put the past behind. Um, Matthew 5, 23-24 says, Therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So, um, listen, again, before you start going through all your spiritual ritualism, but all your spiritual acts and things in uh, in public, in the altar, and in the house of the Lord, you go and you make that right with your spouse. And you begin to work out a plan and a process. And you get accountable to a coach or a Christian counselor or a pastor. And you start working that process. And every step of the way, you give a report, you give accountability. Because you're restoring a marriage with a vulnerable person, a person you have hurt and a person uh, and you were hurt yourself basically and so the two of you together need guidance and direction and accountability amen uh, to fully honor the God of the second chance we have to follow his example and obey his, obey his direction to forgive those that we have injured or those that have, for, have injured us so it goes both ways we put the past behind this is a mandatory concept of a Christian is something we have to do. Unresolved in issues that might limit our daily lives include things like trauma from the childhood, neglect from childhood, shame over previous actions before becoming a Christian, shame over previous actions after becoming a Christian, doing a less than adequate task on a job that returns to haunt you, guilt over the lack of some action on your part, resentment towards someone who has hurt you in the past, any of these examples or any other that you may have in mind. You want to continue uh, continue to these things and continue to haunt your thoughts or impact your behavior. You need to find ways to be free of their distracting influence. You don't just say, and this is this is really too common, you don't show I can't help it, I've been hurt in the past. I can't help it, I've been wounded. I can't help it, I've been a victim. Uh, our heart goes out to you, man. I will tell you, you know, but the truth is Jesus experienced that for you on the cross. And even though your pain is deep, and even though what happened to you was unfair, you did not deserve it, you don't deserve to be hurting today either. Jesus has taken your heartache and your pain, and He can restore your marriage, and He can restore your life, but you're going to have to be willing to let Him. You can't use your past and your victimization uh, to shape the future of your life. Your life 
is not supposed to be built around the injuries and the wounds that have been inflicted upon you. Your life is supposed to be built around the promises of God and the destiny that He has set on you. And this includes your marriage. Yes, the devil will get in there and he'll use someone, one of you in the marriage relationship. He'll cause us to drift. He'll cause us to get bitter and unforgiving because he wants to destroy your relationship. But ultimately, he wants to rob you of your destiny. You personally and you too corporately. And you don't let him. Amen? Uh, so there's all kinds of things that we want to take in contact here and think about as we deal with the unforgiveness and the things that are uh, pressing upon our lives. Um, I, I, how do we help people get beyond their past and distance themselves from their past? Well, you want to be able to confront the past and to understand it. You can't deal with something, as we said earlier, that you refuse to understand. And that's real important. Uh, believe that there's help and freedom for you. You don't have to be a victim all your life. And that's just what I've been saying about victimization. Embrace the grace of God through Jesus Christ. The fact is, if you uh, repent from your past, God forgave you. Not to accept that is actually to re reject the gift of Christ. Tell your story to someone you trust. Covering the issues and details. There's something cleansing and powerful excuse me, about sharing your struggles with someone else. Share them with your pastor. Share them with a Christian counselor. Do everything today with integrity and excellence so that you can look back over your life with satisfaction rather than pain or shame. Forgive anyone who's hurt you whether or not they repent of their actions. See, here's the thing. Even if that spouse runs off and marries somebody else, goes off and never comes back, you still have to live. And you want to live with a pure heart and you want to live the best life that God has for you. That means you're going to have to let that person go by forgiving them and releasing them. Amen? Uh, and then seek further Christian counseling if you're unable to get free from some of these past things. Get some pastoral guidance. Get in the Word and let God speak to you, amen, uh, to help break you free from this bondage of the past. And uh, and let God work with you. And, and, and you will be free, amen, and, and you can be blessed. Uh, marriage is a beautiful thing. The idea and the concept that every young person generally has is that marriage is what's going to make my life whole. That's what's going to make me happy. That's going to make me full of joy. And the truth is, is that marriage may be one of the greatest tests that you'll ever experience. And it's not a short one. <laughs> Amen. But it'll sure bring you into a better person as you become one with your spouse. Scripture says iron sharpens iron. That means that husbands and wives often are opposites. And we make each other better people. Amen. Not by rejecting the rough places or rejecting one another's personalities where we're different but by learning to be smooth as we flow together as we work together as we love each other amen helping couples is a powerful ministry counseling is a powerful ministry and there are all levels and degrees of it you can function as a biblical or christian counselor within the local church just as a volunteer many churches hire christian counselors to do pastoral counseling uh, there are chaplaincy positions that you can get jobs uh, you you become there are all kinds of chaplains uh, but in almost every type of chaplaincy you're going to find yourself at some time or another doing family or marital counseling I don't care if you're a hospice chaplain uh, when you counsel uh, people who are dealing with end of life issues you're dealing not with the patient but you're dealing with the entire family and out of grief come marital problems that come strife and contention and there you go you're dealing with these issues so uh, in just about every capacity of ministry counseling is going to arise and so as you take these materials and these tools and put them in your tool bag, so to speak. You'll be able to draw these things out and you'll be able to prepare something effective for those people that come to you who are having problems and issues in their marriage. I want to say this again. Um, sometimes people uh, don't want to get a divorce, but they can't stop it. Sometimes it wasn't their fault. Sometimes they had no choice. They were left, abandoned. Uh, some were mistreated. Some were violated. I understand those things. But if you can, two Christian people can work out anything. But they've got to be willing to obey the Lord. And they've got to be willing themselves to do what's necessary to be done. Amen. To make it work. God bless you. We love you.